from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of DockerCon Live 2020. Brought to you by Docker and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome to the special Cube coverage of DockerCon 2020. It's a virtual digital event co-produced by Docker and theCUBE. Thanks for joining us. We have a great segment here. Precision cancer medicine really is evolving where the personalization and the data are really going to be important to personalize those treatments based upon unique characteristics of the tumors. This is something that's been a real hot, hot talk talking point and, and focus area in the industry and technology is here to help. We've got two great guests who are using uh, technology, Docker, Docker containers, a variety of other things to help the process go further along. We got, and we got here Sabrina Yan, who's a bioinformatics research assistant and Camille Tuk, who's a student and intern. You guys have done some compelling work. Thanks for joining this uh, DockerCon virtual live. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having Thanks. us. So first, tell us about yourselves and what are you guys doing at the Children's Cancer Institute? That's where you're located. Uh, what's going on there? Tell us what you guys are doing there. Sure, so uh, at the Children's Cancer Institute, um, as it sounds, we do a lot of research when it comes specifically to children's cancers. So uh, children are unique in the sense that a lot of the typical treatments we use for adults may or may not work or will have adverse side effect kits. So what we do is we do all kinds of research, both wet lab and our lab, which we call a dry lab, where we do uh, research in silico using computers to develop pipelines in order to improve outcomes for children. And, uh, and what are some of the things you guys have to deal with, obviously on the tech side, but also there's the workflow of the patients, survival rates, capacity, uh, those constraints that you guys are dealing with, and you, what are some of, the, some of the things going on there that you have to deal with and you're trying to improve the outcome? What specific outcomes are you trying to work through? Well, at the moment, um, off of the, the past decade and all the work we've done in the past decade, we've um, made a substantial impact on the survivability of several high-risk cancers in our pediatrics. Uh, and we've got a certain program, which Sabrina will talk about uh, in, in more depth, uh, called the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. And essentially that, that aims to reduce childhood cancer in children uh, to zero. So that, in other words, will be um, improving survivability to 100%. And hopefully no lives will be lost by cancer. And what are you guys doing specifically? What's your, your job? What's your focus? Yeah, so uh, part of our uh, lab group called Computational Biology, uh, we run a processing pipeline, a whole genome and RNA-seq processing pipeline that given the sequencing information from a kid, so we sequence their healthy cells and we sequence their tumor cells, we analyze them together and what we do is we find the mutations that are causing the cancer. Uh, that helps us determine what treatments or what clinical trials might be most effective for the kid. And so uh, specifically our lab works on that pipeline where we run a whole bunch of uh, bioinformatics tools for that, um, that area, bioinformatics, which is basically just biology informatics. And we use the data generated from sequencing in order to extract those mutations that will be the cancer driving mutations that hopefully we can target in order to treat the kids. You know, you hear about you know tech and you hear Facebook, personalization, recommendation engines, what to click on. You guys are really doing really more personalization around treatment, um, recommendations, these kinds of things come into it. Can you share a little bit about what goes on there and, and, and tell us what's happening? Well, as, as you mentioned, when you first um, brought us into this, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at the, um, the, the profile of the tumor itself. And that allows us to um, specialize the medication and the um, treatment for that patient. Um, and essentially that, that lets us um, improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the treatment, which in turn obviously has an impact on the survivability of cancer. What are some of the technical things? How did you guys get involved with Docker? Where does Docker fit into all of this? Yeah, I'm sure Camille will have plenty to bring up on this as well. <laughs> but um, yes, it's been quite a project to convert the pipeline that we have, which um, we have built on a specific platform and is, is working great, but as with most tools and a lot of things that you develop when you're engineers, uh, it's pretty easy for them to become platform specific and 
moment, then they're kind of stuck there and you have to re-engineer the whole thing for it to work on another platform. And that's just such a pain to do. So um, the project that Camille and myself were, were working on was actually taking each of the individual tools we use in the pipeline and dockerizing them individually, uh, containing them with the dependencies they need so that we could hook them up any way we want so we can configure the pipeline, not just customize uh, based off of the the data, like we're on the same pipeline on every kid, even being able to change the pipeline to discover different things for different kids, to be able to do that easily, um, to be able to run it on different platforms. You know, the fact that we have the choice not only means that we could save money, but if there's a cloud instance that will run an app faster if there's a platform that you know wanting to collaborate with us and they say oh we have this awesome data we'd love for you to analyze it's over here and we're like oh well our pipeline's over here okay. yeah. use my cool. tool it's really great Not yeah really. and so having portability is a big thing as well and so i'm sure camille can go on about uh some of the pain points of having to dockerize all of the different apps but you know, even though there are some challenges associated with doing it, I think the payoff is massive. Camille, you know, dig into this because this is one of the things where you got a problem statement, you got a real world example, cancer patients, life or death, you got some serious things going on here. You're a techie, you get in there, what's going on? You're like, okay, this is going to be easy. I just wrangle the data. I throw some compute at it. It's over, right? No, what, what how did you, <laughs> just take us through uh, 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 the life there you've been well, living. Right, so um, as, as Sabrina mentioned before, um, first and foremost, uh, we're, we're on the scale of several hundred terabytes worth of data for every single patient. Um, so obviously we can start to understand um, just how beneficial it is uh, to move the pipeline to the data rather than the other way around. Um, so much time would be saved, uh, money costs as well. Um, in terms of actually dockerizing the, um, the programs, that analyze the data, um, it was quite difficult. And I think Sabrina would agree, me, would agree with me on this point. Um, the primary issue was that uh, almost all of the apps we um, encountered within the pipeline were very, very heavily dependent on very specific versions of so many dependencies. Like that, they were just um, built upon so many other different apps and they were very heavily fine-tuned so dockerizing it was um, quite difficult because we had to preserve every single version of every single dependency in one instance just to ensure that that was working. And these apps get updated quite sem semi-regularly. So we had to ensure that um, uh, our dockers would survive those updates. So how, what did it really take to dockerize your pipeline? I mean, it was a whole um, project where um, myself, Camille, we had a whole bunch of um, extra bioinformatics interns join us over the summer, which was fantastic as well. And we basically had a whole team of us where it's like, okay, here's another bioinformatics tool in the pipeline. You get to dockerize grid, you get to dockerize purple, you get to dockerize sage, each tool individually, and then you spend uh, days or weeks on it, depending on the app. Some are easier than others, um, but particularly when it comes to uh, things uh, or bioinformatics tools. Uh, some of them are very memory hungry. Some of them are very finicky. Some of them are a lot more stable than others. And so you could spend one day dockerizing a tool and it's done, you know, in a handful of hours, or sometimes it could take uh, up to a week and you're just getting this one tool done. And the idea behind the whole team working on it was eventually you slog through this process and then you have um, a Docker file set up where anyone can run it on any system and we know we have an identical setup, which was not true before because I remember when I started and I was trying to get the pipeline running on my own machine, a lot of things just didn't work. It's like, oh, you don't have the very specific version of R that this developer has or, oh, that's not working because you don't have this specific DAR file that actually has bug fixes in it just for us. But like, oh, well. You had a lot of limitations and, before the Docker yeah. and Dockerizing, Docker containerizing it. Life was tough. What was it like before and after? Mm. Well, I'll, I'll probably speak more to before. It was basically, uh, yeah, days or weeks just trying to set up uh, and install everything needed to run the whole pipeline. Um, yeah, it it took a long time, and even then, a lot of things didn't work. It's like, oh, you got to set up this, you know, depend, uh, this specific version of Python. Oh, but you need 
these other three for different programs or you need this version of R, but then this new upgrade of the tool doesn't work with that version of R. So all, all kinds of issues that you run into when these tools depend on entirely different things. And to install like four different versions of Python or three different versions of R or different versions of Java on the one machine yeah. in order just to run it is a bit of a pain. What a hassle. It's a hassle so, basically. It's a nightmare. Uh, yeah. And now and after, so, you're yeah, golden. So after, probably Camille can speak to that. Yeah. So what's it like after? Uh, it's 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 surpri it's ridiculously efficient. Like it's 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 incredible. Um, well, like I mentioned before, uh, as soon as we um, set in stone those uh, the versions of the dependencies, Docker keeps them naturally, and we can specify the versions within the Docker uh, the container. Um, so we can we can absolutely guarantee that that application will run successfully and effectively every single time. Share with me how complicated these pipelines are. It sounds like that's a key piece here for you guys. And, and you had all the hassles that you, know, you do your, you get Dockerized up and things work smoothly, got that. But tell mm -hmm. us about the, the pipelines. What's, what's so complicated about them? Honestly, the biggest complication is all of the connection. It's not as simple as um, run A, run B, run C, and then you're done. That would be nice, but that's not how these things work. Uh, it, uh, you have a network of programs, but the outputs for this become the input for another, and you have to run this program before this one, before this one, but some of the outputs become inputs for multiple programs, and by the time you hook the whole thing up, it looks like a gigantic web of applications where all the connections are it, it's a massive, well, it almost looks like a massive mess when you look at it, yeah. but having each of the individual tools contained and working means that we can hook them all up. And uh, even though it looks complicated, it would be far more complicated if we had that entire pipeline, you know, in a single program, like having to code that whole thing in a single group would be an absolute nightmare. Whereas being able to have each of the tools um, as individual dockers means we just have to link the inputs and outputs, which is a task. But once you've done that, it means that you know each of the individual tools um, will run. And if an individual tool fails for whatever reason, memory or other issues you run into, you can rerun that one individual tool, rehook the outputs into whatever the next program is and keep going without having one massive you know, uh, program or file where it fails midway through and there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and you got to unpack everything. So it's basically you get the goodness, do the work up front, and you get a lot of goodness mm. coming out of it. So this, this comes to the future of health. What are the key takeaways that you guys have uh, from this process? And how does it apply to things that might be helpful to you <coughs> around the corner or today, like deep learning? Um, as you get more um, tools out there with machine learning and deep learning, um, we hope there's going to be some cool things coming out of this. What do you guys see here? Any, any insights? Well, we have a section of our, uh, the computational biology team that is looking into doing more uh, predictive tasks, working out um, basically the risks of people developing cancer, or the risks of kids developing cancer. And that's something you can do when you have all of this data, but that requires a lot of analysis as well. And so one of the benefits of you know being able to have these very movable pipelines and tools makes it easier to run them on the cloud makes it easier to share your processing with other research institutes or hospitals um, just making collaboration easier means that data sharing becomes a possibility whereas before if you have three different organizations with their data in three different places um, how do you share that when moving the data isn't really a feasible task. How can you analyze it in a way that's practical? And so oh, and one, of, one of the benefits of Docker is all of these advanced tools coming out. You know, if there's some amazing predictor that comes out that uses some kind of regression or, or deep learning or whatever, if we wanted to add that, being able to Dockerize a complex tool into a single Dockerized app makes it less complicated to add that into the pipeline in the future, if that's something we'd like to do. Camille, any thoughts on your end on this? Actually, I was, uh, Sabrina read my mind for the last point. I was just thinking about um, scalability, definitely, is a very, it's a huge point. Because um, the pipeline grows as the technology does. 
um, any kind of new technology that we'd like to integrate into the pipeline as of now, it'd be significantly easier with the use of Docker. You can just Dockerize that technology and then implant it straight into the pipeline. Minimal stress. So productivity, agility, does it come home for you guys? Does that resonate? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And you got the collaboration, so there's business benefits, the outcomes are there. Any proof points you could share on um, some results that you guys are seeing, some fruit from the tree, if you will, from all this goodness? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the things we've been working on is actually a collaboration with Ozbio Commons and Kavatica. They've built a platform specifically for developing pipelines, which we've wanted to test out. And they have support for Docker containers built into their platform, which makes it very easy to uh, push all our containers up to their platform, hook them up, and be able to collaborate with them, not only to try a new platform uh, with our Dockerized apps, but also to help them develop their platform, be able to sh share and access data that's been uploaded there as well by other people. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't Dockerized our app. It just wouldn't have actually, it wouldn't have been possible. And now that we have, we've been able to collaborate with them in terms of improving their platform, but also to be able to uh, share and run our pipelines on other data, is, which is pretty good. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you on theCUBE here on DockerCon 2020 from Down Under. Um, great internet connection. You guys got great internet down there. People in the US get that all the time, but we're, yeah. we're remote, we're, we're sheltering in place here. Stay safe on you guys. Final question, could you, uh, each share in your own words, from a developer, from a tech standpoint, as you're in this core role, super important role, and the outcomes are significant and have real impact. What has the technology, what has Dockerization done for you guys and for your work environment and for the business? Share in your own words what it means. A lot of other developers are watching. What's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, the really practical point is we've massively increased the capacity of the pipeline. Uh, one thing that's been quite fantastic this year is we've got a lot of increased support for the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, which means going into the future, <laughs> we'll actually be able to open up a program uh, to every child in Australia that uh, has cancer. We'll be able to add them to the program. Whereas currently, we're only able to enroll kids who are at uh, low survivability rates. So about 30%, the lowest 30% of survivability we're able to enroll in the program currently. But having a pipeline where we can just double the memory like that, double the amount of data, uh, and the fact that we can change the instances freely to just double the capacity, triple the capacity, means that now that we have the support to be able to enroll potentially every kid in Australia, um, once we've upgraded the whole pipeline, it means we'll actually be able to cope with the amount of children being enrolled. Whereas on the existing pipeline, we're currently at capacity. So doing the upgrade in a really practical way means that we're actually going to be able to triple the number of kids in Australia we can add onto the program, which Un wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Unleashing the limitations and making it Totally scalable. Camille, your thoughts oh, yeah. as developers are watching, you're in there, you're your hand, getting your hands dirty, you built it, it's showing some traction. What's, what's, your, what's your take, what's your view? Well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, like Sabrina said, it just, it feels fantastic knowing that what we're doing is, has a substantial and quantifiable impact on the, um, on uh, the subset of the population. And we're literally saving the lives, saving lives with the work that we're doing. Um, uh, in terms of developing with with that technology, it's um it's such a breeze, especially compared to um I've I've had minimal contact with what it was like without Docker, and from the horror stories I've heard, it's 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 a godsend. It's it's um it's really improved the quality of developing. Well, you guys have a great mission, and congratulations on the success. Real impact right there. You guys are doing great work, and it must feel great. I'm happy for you and uh, great to connect with you guys and continue you know, using technology to get the outcomes, not just using technology. So fantastic story. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, I'm John Furrier. We're here for DockerCon 2020, DockerCon virtual, DockerCon digital. It's a digital event this year. Obviously we're all sheltering in place. We're in the Palo Alto studios 
for DockerCon 2020. I'm John Furrier. Stay with us for more coverage digitally. Go to dockercon.com for more. Check out this, all these different sessions. And of course, stay with us for this feed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.